and I felt like the Lord just dropped this sentence in my heart a few of the favorite things my favorite things about serving God a few of the my favorite things about serving God and from that this lesson was born I felt like the Lord communed with my heart and I pray that it will speak to you I pray the Lord would um, answer some questions you've had give you direction that you've been searching for and potentially if there is some missing component in your walk with God that the Lord would help you hear it and see it highlighted and give you the strength and the wisdom to implement it everybody say favor amen I believe in the favor of God amen I I can attest to the fact that many many times I have experienced the favor of God how many of you could look back at a time in your life and you say God favored me amen favor is a wonderful thing and it is God's nature to favor his children now I was listening this morning the truth is it rains on the just and the unjust there can be a, a, a righteous man and a woman that owns a 10 acre plot of land and there can be a wicked man and a woman that live next door and the rain will come over and it will rain on both of their fields and they could potentially have the same crop and sometimes they may have less of crop it rains on the just it is the nature of God to bless all men but there is a dimension of God that only those who walk in a pleasing way before him experience God's favor and so I say to you to begin with that favor is not free amen favor uh, there are things that that we do that position us in a place where we will experience the favor of God and so I think about a few of the, my favorite things about serving God you know uh, a number of weeks I believe the Sunday school lessons talked about the benefits of God Psalms 103 and verse 2 bless the Lord O my soul and forget not all of his benefits amen I, I love the blessings of God I, I love to know that everything in my life God gave me amen from my from my bride to the place that I live to the food that I eat I live with a knowledge if I've got it God gave it to me amen if I have a thought in my head that's good God gave it to me if I preach a good sermon God gave it to me if I write out a message that blesses somebody if it's good it's God I'm mediocre and poor all by myself amen and so the blessings of God I enjoy them in my life I enjoy the promises of God things uh, things that I believe because of what God has told me through the Word of God there are things that I believe because of things the Lord has given me a dream or a vision about things that I have heard the man of God preach about uh, God has used men and women to prophesy things into my life and I have promises I I love the promises of God amen I thank God for the promises of God it helps us to endure sometimes when things get hard I thank God for the peace of God thank God for the peace of God amen storms can come winds can blow sickness can come all kinds of things can go wrong but I can go and find peace with God and like Jesus sleeping in the bottom of the boat when the storm was raging I can have that same kind of peace where I can have the peace of God I, that's one of my favorite things about living for God amen I, I one of the favorite things I have in my heart is, is the hope that we have you want to see a picture of hope read Revelations chapter 22 yeah I want to go to heaven how about you I have a great hope uh, that isn't anchored for the soul I love spiritual experiences I love it amen I think sometimes people can get over uh, concerned and pursuing spiritual experiences but there's nothing wrong with want to have a spiritual experience I'm of the opinion that most people that live for God uh, through their youth and into their adulthood it is directly connected to their experiencing spiritual things that professors can't undermine friends can't destroy and the troubles of life can't wash away you have an undeniable experience that says hey I know God is real I know the Word of God is true I know the Holy Ghost is a bona fide thing I got the Holy Ghost 
And I, I love spiritual experiences. I, I can look back at Sunday. I had a fresh touch of the Holy Ghost on my life. Amen. I guess that's one of the things that makes us Pentecostals. We believe that you can still experience something in God today. Amen. Mm -hmm. Spiritual experiences. I'm thankful for the Word of God. Amen. I love the Word of God. I'm thankful for the things that, that it has shown me because it gives me some information. Some things are settled. Things that, that, that there's no way I can know scientifically, I can know by faith. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. That the things that were made by, were made of things that do not appear. I believe God is the creator, and therefore, because there's a God, I have a purpose. I'm not just a, a, a scientific experience. I'm not just some beast that's going to be born and die and become dirt. I have a supernatural beginning and a supernatural eternity. And the word of God lays out the parameters of my reality. I understand my world, I understand my life, I understand my position, I understand my responsibilities, I understand my promises. I love the Word of God. How about you? Amen. I love the Word of God. John chapter 14 and verse 22, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples, and, and Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. Amen. And so when we talk about favor, it is an inconvenient truth for some today, but favor, to have the favor of God, there is a corresponding responsibility that we have with God. To experience God's favor, you must operate within the parameters God has established for us in his word. Without a doubt, today we live in the New Testament and there are things that God no longer expects or requires from us. The Bible tells us that in the Old Testament was a figure, a form, a shadow of things to come. Amen. There are some people that are being drawn away by a, a deception that was in the New Testament that, that people need to begin to live by the law. They need to keep the Sabbath. They need to worry about uh, the various touch not, taste not, handle not. Amen. They think they, they, they're telling people they need to keep the holy days. All kinds of things. But an example of, of, of something that was required in the Old Testament that is not required today is the Sabbath. In, this, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath was a day of rest. And you couldn't do any work. You couldn't light a fire. A lot of people that say they're going to keep Sabbath, they drive their, drive their car, they cook their food. They're, not, they're breaking the very thing that they say that they're going to keep. If you're going to keep the Sabbath, uh, uh, you can't walk very far. Uh, the Bible would really forbid you from coming to church because you have to walk there unless you live right down next door to the church. You can't cook any food. Uh, you, you've got to have your food separated. The food that you're going to eat on the Sabbath. Uh, this, all kinds of, of the law required. If you were going to keep the Sabbath, and there are people out there, uh, even people that at one time had truth have been drawn away by this special knowledge that, you know, the Sabbath... But the Bible teaches us that the Sabbath was a type and a form that we experience in the New Testament through the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. When you get the Holy Ghost, this is the rest wherewith the weary shall find rest. When you get the Holy Ghost, amen, you don't just get rest on Saturday. You can get rest every day. Is there a principle you need to rest? Absolutely. But we are not bound that you're going to get stoned for picking up a stick. Somebody say, thank God. Amen. Amen. So there are a lot of things. In fact, I read that there are 16, 613 specific commands 
in the Old Testament that if you were going to walk in the favor of God in the Old Testament manner, there were things you had to do. And it was onerous. It was costly. It was difficult. What do you mean? Can you give me an example? Well, if you uh, wanted to have your sins remitted, you had to take a sin offering to the house of God. And whether you live five miles from the house of God or a hundred miles from the house of God, if in Jerusalem was where the place that you went. If if uh, you were required to go to Jerusalem three times a year, and if you lived two hundred miles away, you had to make that journey walking. They have cars and trucks and vans and trucks and trains and planes. They had to make the journey three times a year to appear before the Lord. Somebody said, that's a lot of trouble. Three times a year. There were holy days they had to keep. They had to keep the Passover. If you didn't keep the Passover, the Bible says you would be cut off from the people of God. The Old Testament was a form, but for someone to live in the favor of God in the Old Testament... It was a very challenging thing. In fact, Paul tells us in the New Testament that it was no one could fulfill the law. They were going to break some part of the law. But in the New Testament, even though we are not bound to do many of the Old Testament requirements, there are still expectations from God. God has commandments in the New Testament. Amen. For instance, in the Old Testament, it was circumcision. The New Testament equivalent is baptism. As a man, I can tell you that baptism is much preferable. Amen. It's very important for us to recognize that, that though we are not required to do all these things that are, were required in the Old Testament, God still has requirement. It's easier. It doesn't require uh, as much effort. It's not works. It's obedience. It's obedience. A lot of times people get lost in the discussion of faith and works when they don't realize when the Bible talks about works, it's not talking, it's, the, it's talking about the Old Testament washings and cleansings and sacrificial system that the Old Testament is full of thou shalt and thou shalt not. But in the New Testament, uh, we experience the blessing of God through faithful obedience. Somebody said, praise God. And so the New Testament covenant has requirements. Baptism is a New Testament requirements. Faithfulness to worship with the body of Christ is, is an equivalent to making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Daily disciplines is what it means to be a disciple with Christ. God still expects us to be separate from the world, but in a different manner. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, it's in your notes. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And for ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Everybody say favor. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. How great of a promise is it? Read the next scripture. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. One of the only times in the New Testament where the writer takes on that prophetic voice of thus saith the Lord is found right here. And it's dealing with a very grave and important subject that though we are not required to be Jews in a New Testament sense, we are still required to live righteous in a New Testament sense. God's called us to holiness and separation. And though the world at large has lost the ideas of what it means to just be moral, to just be moral, we have mainline denominational churches uh, that have lost not only the gender distinction in dress, they've lost gender distinction in sexuality. They've lost their minds. But it is a progression. They lost gender distinction in how they dressed. 
So it shouldn't be any amazing to us to look and say they forgot what God said that a man and a woman should be a man and a woman. And now look what the world has done. The church world has lost their concepts because they, they begin to read the word of God and question it and doubt it and, and figure out you know, why it doesn't apply to them today. And what do you end up with? Look at them. They've become just a greater and to a greater degree a, 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 a group of confused people that basically depends on whatever the preacher or their denomination is teaching. The denomination teaches something differently. I read the Methodist just uh, ordained a um, someone that doesn't claim to be a male or a female as a deacon in their church. That just blows my mind. But that's the world we live in. And we have to recognize it doesn't matter how wicked our world becomes. We still are called to holiness. We are still called to modesty. We're still called to separation from the world. And even though the world may look at us and say, man, what is it about Pentecostals wearing dresses? And I'll say to them, wearing a dress isn't Pentecostal. Women having long hair is not a Pentecostal thing. It was, used to be a Baptist thing. It used to be a Methodist thing. Christianity used to teach in, in mass that men and women should look different. Not only has the Christianity has large lost their idea of, of, of distinction, they, they don't even know how to spell the word modesty. Somebody said amen. And so if you want to be favored in the New Testament, uh, we still have a responsibility to live a life that is separate and holy from the world, even if the world that calls themselves the church disagrees with what the Word of God says. Amen. Somebody said, praise God. Amen. That was free. The ingredients of favor. Many people confuse mercy for grace. Ecclesiastes 8 and 11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And sometimes people, and you see this, you see this in our world today, People can go to church and feel the presence of the Lord and they interpret a spiritual experience to be God's acceptance. But what they are experiencing is mercy and it's not grace. Because grace is a teacher to righteousness. The Bible says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. If someone's not living soberly, righteously, and godly, grace is either not working in their life or they're not listening to grace in their life. Somebody said amen. I thank God for mercy, but I want to listen to the voice of grace and follow its dictates. Amen. So that if you want to be favored, you know, it's hard to say which one's first. These are all uh, jointly important, and there are probably other things I won't cover, but these are, these are just a few. Number one, repentance. Repentance is the door to the favor of God. Amen. Always has been. From the beginning until the end. Repentance without repentance. You're not going to be saved. There has to be a contrition in your heart that says, I was wrong, I am sorry, I want to do better. God, forgive me. God, help me. And I have found and I have seen that if you will have a humble heart that repents, God will move heaven and earth to help you to overcome whatever it is you're dealing with. But it begins with repentance. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Repentance is always in order. And if you don't think you've done anything wrong, repent anyway. Because it could be your pride lying to you. 
So lay your pride on the altar and say, Jesus, forgive me. Even if I don't think I've done anything wrong, Lord God, I want to be right. Amen. Number one. Number two, obedience to God's word. Jesus gave us an example of obeying God's word and his will. Jesus said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. When it comes to the will and the word of God, it's not a matter what you think. God does not care what you think. How many of you remember your parents saying, uh, do this, and you say, why? And they said, because I said so. God, our Father, has the same attitude. He is not concerned about your understanding. He is concerned about your obedience. And I'm telling you, obedience brings understanding. You may not understand how water in Jesus' name washes away your sin, but do it in obedience, and whoo! Wow, hallelujah, I all of a sudden understand. You may not understand why living a separated holy life matters, but you start living a holy separated life, and you're like, why is everybody looking at me strange? <laughs> why is it I feel holy and separated before God? Amen, don't worry about understanding. Worry about getting your life in lined up with the word of God. And when you begin to pursue God with a humble heart and hunger for the holiness of God, Amen. Everybody say favor. Favor comes with that. Submission. And there are many dimensions of submission. One dimension of submission, Hebrews 13 and 17, obey them to have rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your soul as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable to you. It's important for us to have a humble, submitted heart to those God has placed in your life. You know, I'm the pastor, so it's, you know, I'm talking about myself uh, to some degree. But I believe it is true uh, that we have a submitted and humble heart toward, uh, the Bible says, submit yourself to one another. You know, one time my wife was in a seminar and it was for Christian educators and they were talking about, you know, how can we get our schools to work better? Than, and uh, she made the point, she said, uh, Submission, and to a person, they all looked at her like she's crazy. Submit, they hate, the world hates the word submit. Because the Bible teaches that women should submit themselves to their husband, amen, as it is, is uh, pleasing to the Lord, amen. Children should submit themselves to their parents, and ultimately the man should submit himself to God. And submission is, is more of an attitude than what we say, amen. It's difficult when the man isn't obeying God. It puts a woman in a difficult situation to submit to her husband when he's not doing right. But ultimately, we submit to God. Somebody said amen. And so there has to, there, we must pray for, these are not things we naturally accumulate. It requires spiritual stretching on our part to have a submitted heart toward the work of God. And to just accept that well, this is what God has placed in my life. This is what God wants for my life. And we decide to obey the word of God. Everybody say favor. Number four, faithfulness. Revelation 17, 14. I'm preaching to the choir tonight. You're here on Wednesday night. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, you're pretty faithful. Amen. You had the rain. You had all kinds of reasons. But you're here tonight. So I'm preaching to the choir. I believe that the, the choir needs to be preached to. Amen. I believe you, the Lord gives his best stuff to those that are closest to him. Amen. Jesus, gave, Jesus allowed those three disciples that were closest to him, that went further with him, that were there with him the most, they experienced the greatest things. And the more faithful you are, the more favor you will experience. And that's not just church attendance, but it is church attendance. It's, it's all of it together. Amen? Everybody say favor. Number four, fellowship. Acts 2 and 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and, what's it say? And fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. You know, there's some people today don't believe that going to church is important. <sighs> Amen. You know, as long as they go uh, Christmas... Easter and Mother's Day, they're, what, C -E -E -C -E -M? Uh, uh, they're good. But fellowship 
is one of the greatest reasons why we should make church a priority because fellowship is where God's spirit is. Uh, wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, he is in the midst of them. The Bible says if we, everybody say we, walk in the light. Everybody say we. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have, everybody say we, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Can I tell you, you don't get to fellowship the blood unless you fellowship in your brother and your sister. Amen. We must strive to be to be faithful in our fellowship. Everybody say sacrifice. Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a... What kind? A living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your... And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I believe one of the hallmarks of the apostolic movement that I experienced as a child and as a young man, and I see it within the heritage of my family, is it was marked by a spirit of sacrifice financially, prayerfully, fasting, and giving themselves to the work of God. When you give yourself to the work of God, it is costly. I have heard of people that have been offered uh, professional uh, uh, sports positions, but because of the demand of God on their life, they walked away from it. I have heard of people giving up all manner of things because of the demand of God on your life. And there will be times when God's demand on your life and your priority to God, there'll be some jobs you can't take. There'll be some places you can't go. There'll be some things you're not able to participate in that will bar some access to you. In my own personal life, one of the greatest examples that I can think of at the moment is, uh, you know, I, I uh, uh, worked in the business world for most of my life and, and in sales. And, uh, you know, business is done around the bar. Relationships are done around beer. And people build connections, amen, having a party. Well, you know, I'm not going to do that. And I know there were territories and and accounts and opportunities that never came my way because I made a choice of not being in that environment. And I have no regrets. <laughs> I have no regrets. Amen. Because if, you know, Paul said, you know, I count it all but fertilizer. He used another word. I just count it all but, but dung that I may gain Christ. And we have to, there has to, we just have to understand living for God's going to cost us something. There's going to be times when the call and the purpose of God is going to make a, a demand on us. And we just have to be willing to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Sometimes being faithful to church puts a, it costs you something. Amen. Somebody say favor. Amen. I've shared this before, but I'm going to share it one more time. There was a, a missionary that came through in a church that I think we were married. Were we married yet? The missionary? If we weren't married, we were almost married. We're close to being married. We were engaged, I guess, if we weren't married. And uh, he was taking up a sacrificial offering. And the Lord had been dealing with me for a long time of, of uh, quit trusting some stuff that I owned. I wasn't working with it, but I owned it. And specifically, I used to have a landscaping business, and I had a trailer full of lawnmowers and uh, weed eaters and blowers, and it was a trailer full of stuff. And the missionary was going around, and he was uh, basically appealing to people to give what the Lord put on their heart, and he would sell it, guns, boats, all manner of things. And the Lord touched my heart, and I went home, and I got my, my favorite suit. I got my favorite pair of shoes because he's also taking clothes and giving them to the to the national preacher, took, got my favorite Bible, 
and I got my trailer and I took it and I and I laid it before uh, that missionary's feet, if you will. And uh, I had such a great peace about it. You know, if I kept that suit, I couldn't wear it still. <laughs> Amen. I gave my favorite Bible and the Lord gave me another one. But one of the things that happened when I first started pastoring, like summer, the, the grass cutting season showed up. And uh, it, the pastor had always cut the grass. And uh, so the other pastor had left and taken his mower with him and here's the grass. And, and so I went to Sears and bought a uh, craftsman, I don't know, you know, $1,000 lawnmower, whatever it was. And I had it in the back of my truck, and I pulled up to the churchyard, and and a man that didn't go to the church, his relative came to the church, lived behind the church, and he didn't have hardly any grass, but his yard was connected to the church, and he was riding the same lawnmower, cutting the church grass. And so I, I stopped, I said, I said, Bo, what are you doing? And he said, you know, I knew that the pastor left, and I knew the grass needed to be cut, so I just went and lot, bought a lawnmower, and I'm going to keep the grass cut. Amen. And when I lived there, I don't know that I cut my own grass. or the, I never cut the church grass for seven years. And I, I, the Lord kind of gave me this, that if you give God your lawnmowers, he'll cut your grass. If the Lord puts something in your heart to do sacrificially, don't worry about it. God will repay God will owe no man nothing. Amen. And if there is some time, some thing the Lord puts in your heart to do, don't you worry about it. It's coming back in multiples. Somebody say amen. Everybody say favor. It all kind of runs together. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. Amen. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. When you pay your tithes, you're not right, you're not giving that money to Scott Phillips. You're giving that to God. Amen. You are giving that to God. And it was you give to God. God, He takes an account of that, and He will repay. How many of you found that paying your tithes pays off? Amen. Amen. It pays off. A giving in the offering, giving toward uh, children's ministry, giving towards missionaries, giving toward whatever the Lord puts in your heart. I, you know, giving is the church, and I believe church giving should be, uh, you know, something that we designate and we commit to. But I think just having a heart that is aware of people's needs. Somebody that you know has a need that I think the Lord will move on you to give them a $10 bill. I'm not talking about people asking you for money. But I'm talking about we need to be aware of people around us. And the Lord could use your compassion to win their heart. Amen. Everybody say giving. Somebody say favor. Amen. My seventh point. A mind of thanksgiving and worship towards God will open up the door of favor in your life. The greatest thing you can do is learn how to be thankful. To be thankful in the rain, to be thankful in the sunshine, to be thankful for, for, for the good things, and to be thankful for the bad things. <sighs> Amen. I, I wrote about this this week. I, some of the greatest things that will happen in your life will come through an avenue that looks like trouble. Treasure is born in trouble. Don't don't question what is going on in your life. Be thankful for God's grace that is with you. His grace is sufficient for thee in this. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter, Paul asked the Lord, you know, I've got this thorn in the flesh. I've got this messenger of Satan. Deliver me from it. And he asked the Lord three times, God, you've got to give me some help. Like that story of uh, Jerry Clower told about the guy that was up in the tree and he thought he had a coon and it was a bobcat and he was hollering oh shoot that thing anybody hear this before and he said we want it he said shoot up in amongst us one of us needs some relief amen sometimes you just <laughs> 
You, you just got to trust God with the trouble you're in. Amen. If he don't deliver you from it, he'll keep you through it. Amen. In Jesus' name, I rebuke the devil. Lord Jesus, shoot that thing. Amen. And bonus points. <laughs> the difference maker for us all is desire. Desire is something we, you know, we are aware with desire when it comes to eating. Oh, Jesus, I don't want to get too much conviction today. But Lord Jesus, help me to be as hungry spiritually as I have been sometimes physically. Amen. Ephesians 3 and 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Amen. You want to see more? Pray bigger. Think bigger. Believe bigger. And God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that. Jesus said sometimes you don't have because you don't don't ask. And I think sometimes we don't have bigger because we ask too small. You might I, I had the I had the thought the other day, and while you're praying, you might as well pray big. <laughs> you might as well just remember the, the God that you're praying to made the moon, the stars, and the Milky Way. Might as well just ask big. You know, he may say no. He may not. <laughs> Somebody say, praise God. I want the favor of God. How about you? God, I need your favor. God, I can't make it in this life by myself. God, I don't want to live by myself. I don't want to live without you, Lord. As Moses said, Lord, if you don't go with us, Lord, we don't want to go. God, we want you to be in our lives. And God, I know that we, everyone here, we know about the favor of God. We have experienced the favor of God. We are living in the umbrella of your favor. But God, Lord Jesus, I pray that maybe something that was said tonight and maybe something that wasn't said, the unsaid thing, that God, there may be some deficit or there may be something that we are lacking in. I pray that you, oh God, would help us, Lord, to recognize it and that, Lord Jesus, we would determine to make it right. In the name of Jesus, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Can we just stand together? Amen. I just feel like right now, I think that we just need to pray a humble prayer of repentance. Lord Jesus, uh, search my heart. Search my attitude. Search my mind. Search me, O oh God. And Lord Jesus, if there is any wicked way, any evil thought, any bad attitude, Lord, about anything, maybe I am totally oblivious to it, Lord. And, and, and God, if somebody told me, I would think they were crazy. God, I want you to talk to my heart about everything that I have in it, Lord. God, I want to have a right attitude. I want to have a right spirit. Lord Jesus, God, I don't want to be influenced by the words and the attitudes and, 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 and the actions of other people. I want to have a pure heart about you and your purpose for my life. I want to have a right attitude and a, the right faith concerning the work of God you've placed me in. I want to have the right spirit and the right attitude about my church and my church family, Lord, and the ministry that you've made me a part of, oh God. Lord Jesus, I pray, God, let there be clearness. Let there be nothing separating me from being fully connected, Lord, and plugged into the purpose that you have made for my life, oh God. Lord Jesus, I no longer resist it, but God, I submit, Lord Jesus. I, I connect, Lord Jesus. I, I receive, Lord God. I, I just cease to resist, Lord, and I accept it in the name of Jesus. I receive it, Lord. I receive it, Lord. I pray for a spirit of favor, a greater dimension of favor upon your people, Lord. Lord, I know they love you, they fear you, and God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you, oh God, would open up the windows of heaven and pour them out a blessing that they are unable to contain, God. I pray that you, oh Lord, would give them favor with people around them, people they work for, people uh, that would, God, open doors of opportunity, doors of ministry, Lord Jesus, doors, oh God, God, into things that they have prayed about and maybe even things they've never even been bold enough to pray about. God, we ask you today, we need, we desire your favor. We want your favor. We, oh God, pray for your favor today. 
in the name of Jesus, 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 in the name of Jesus. God, God, help our families today. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, you touch my, my lost brother today. I pray you, oh God, would touch my mom and dad today. God, I pray you touch my, my uncles and aunts, Lord Jesus. I pray you touch my neighbors today. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you, oh God, would quicken the seeds that we have sown in the Bible studies we've taught, Lord Jesus, and the conversations we've had. Lord Jesus, prodigal sons, Lord, backslidden saints, Lord Jesus, people that, 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 that for whatever reason have grown cold and disconnected God we pray for your grace oh God to give us an opportunity oh God to reconnect Lord Jesus and bring a word of reconciliation oh God amen we're just praying right now can we just pray you walk you can kneel amen let's just pray for a little while Lord Jesus we oh God not we don't just want to be favored but we want to be a source of favor for someone else Lord God I don't want to just be blessed but I want to be a blessing Lord I God, I don't just want to see your work. God, I want you to use me in your work, oh God. In the name of Jesus today, Lord, we, oh God, are hungry. And we, oh God, are thirsty, Lord, for the moving and the ministry of the Holy Ghost, oh God, today. Truly, Lord God, we are hungry and thirsty for the work of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, oh God. Lord Jesus, you see, Lord, areas of ministry, Lord, a desire, oh God. Lord, a, a prayer request, Lord, that, that maybe they are unspoken, but Lord, their desire in their hearts, oh God, we pray concerning them today. We pray, oh God, for those unspoken prayer requests, Lord. We pray for those hidden fears, oh God those past hurts God we pray for healing today we pray oh God for healing and peace today in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus hallelujah 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 I read a story or news article this week that doctors have decided that broken hearts never heal Anybody see that? I saw it in my news feed. Broken hearts never heal. And I said, well, just another thing that they're wrong about. Because we serve a God that binds up the brokenhearted, set at liberty them that are bruised, and brings ca those that are captive, brings them out of that captivity. I mean, it doesn't matter what anybody else says about your situation. Whose report will you believe we shall believe the report of the Lord. I feel the Holy